So um, when Helen introduces me, she says that the most important thing that I ever did was lose my job. Um, <laughs> and uh, I took the case to court and I lost. So uh, losing that was the next most important thing I did. Um, and then I won uh, in June this year. Proving that gender critical beliefs are worthy of respect in a democratic society, which means that people should not be discriminated against or harassed at work, as students, as customers, as members of political parties, for holding those perfectly ordinary beliefs that we come in two flavours. There are men and there are women. Um, I still can't quite believe that that is the most important thing that I've done or that that needed to be done, <laughs> but it did. And, and, you know, my inbox is full of people saying, um, I'm being bullied at work, I'm being harassed at work, I'm being investigated at work. I'm sure this room is full of people who've been through that. Um, and so the case doesn't solve that because, um, you know, it's still going on. Employers are still being advised by Stonewall that our beliefs are... Uh, you know, fascist, um, and the process of fighting an investigation is the punishment. Um, but people are protected at work, and we we can push back against that. And I'm going back to court or back to the employment tribunal in March next year to finish my case, which will be to show how I lost my job, what happened, um, and hopefully to win this time. Um, and then I hope the second or the third most important thing that I've done is to co-found Sex Matters, which we launched in March this year. Um, you should have a postcard. Um, which is the campaign for clarity on sex in policy, law and language. Um, because I think this you know this is something that can be explained in 90 seconds but at the same time it's something that's been embedded in almost every single organization every public sector organization um all large corporates universities there is a big job to do to unpick this and we need um organizations to do that we've done an amazing job through uh you know kitchen table organizations through real grassroots organizations in you know in the three years since the beginning of the consultation on the gender recognition act which sort of woke people up to what was happening and we you know we had this amazing focus on the consultation on the gender recognition act um and that was one thing and we won and now there are a hundred things. We uncovered the fact that there are, you know, there are a hundred places, more than a hundred, where self-ID has already been put into policy, where organisations are following Stonewall law, not the law. Um, and so that's what Sex Matters is. Um, join our mailing list, support us, um, you know, be part of it. Um, and our one goal is to defend ordinary language to talk about sex. Um, in law, in policy, in organisations. Um, because without clear language, we can't talk about material reality, we can't talk about fancy ideas, we can't talk about the really basic things of consent, um, which everyone needs to be able to talk about. Children, uh, you know, people with English as a second language, e everyone across society, we, re we need simple, clear languages, language and simple, clear rules. Um, and so I was so excited to come to Oxford University. I thought, what high-minded piece of literature should I start my talk with? <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to talk about heads, shoulders, knees and toes. <laughs> Do you remember that? Head, you know, and you lose, you start at heads, shoulders, knees and toes, and then you lose the head and then you lose the shoulders. And by the end you go, mm, 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 mm. And it gets faster and faster. And, you know, as a kid, it's kind of, a little bit scary, a little bit fun. You, you don't want to say the words when you're not meant to say them because your friends will laugh at you. Um, you know, and at the end, you've got no words. And I kind of think, this is where we are. The words have been taken from us. And the, you know, it started off with the word woman. And at one point, there was a discussion in gender-critical circles. Could we give away the word woman, keep the word female? Woman is gender, female is sex. Didn't work. Hence... 
the definition is really important. Um, but now they're coming after the word mother and the meaning of the word mother. I've also heard opposite sex is misgendering. So using the term opposite sex, there was, a, there was an article in, on the BBC that used the term opposite sex and then it got revised. To, that opposite sex was offensive. So every word that we use to define boundaries, however polite those words are, are deemed unacceptable. And um, as Jane said, you know, the word no, that's ultimately what is being um, defined out of existence. So then I was thinking back to this head, shoulders, knees and toes. When was the first time, the first word that I experienced being lost? And it was 1994. I was in my second year at university in Newcastle. Um, and I, I, this was really stuck in my mind. And I hadn't thought about it for kind of 10 years after that, but we were in a pub and I said something about the transvestite. And this art student turned to me and she was like, you know, she was an art student. She was a <laughs> so I, I listened to her and she said, we don't use that word anymore. It's offensive. And, and she looked at me like I was like, a, you know, rude from, I didn't know anything. We say transgender. And I sort of thought, oh, okay. You know, I was being told you're saying something offensive by somebody who knows. And I went, oh. Um, and I said to her, but, but why? A transvestite's a descriptive word. I, I wasn't saying anything horrible about, I, I can't even remember who it was, but I wasn't saying something horrible. Um, and she said, well, transvestite makes it sound like it's all about clothes. And it's not just about clothes. It's about something much more deeper. It's about gender. And I was thinking agriculture. Like, I'm really, I'm really, really simple. I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not a humanities student. I, okay. Um, and also, this was 1994. This was in the days when, if you had a question, the question stayed with you. Um, you didn't have anywhere to look it up. I mean, you had libraries and stuff, but you didn't have a, like, massive computer in your pocket. Um, and... I do, and 1994 was also significant for me because it was the first, that was the year when I first learned about the internet. And I remember that as well, because I remember I was sitting in a lecture theatre like this, there was a professor or lecturer telling us about the internet and like, explaining this thing to us. I was like, wow, that, and it was, you know, this is the year after the first web browser, web page was put up. You went and go for, and there was like, it was not like it is now. And, and so I went, I thought, this is interesting. Um, and the world kind of changed from there. 1990, if you look at the graph, 1994 is the year the internet took off. Um, and so um, I think we try and understand what's happened, what's, what all this is about. There's the, the medical stuff, there's the philosophical stuff, but there's also just the internet. The internet has changed everything. It's brought, you know, obviously more information and we can all chat and fight with strangers and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> but it's broken the business models of all of the organisations that do thinking. You know, universities, journalism, publishing, politics, their, their business models don't work. And at the same time, there are these new ways of making money by, you know, monetizing our base emotions um, and, you know making us come back for more of what we hate or what we love. Um, and, and I think that thing is part of why this crazy, stupid idea that can be debunked in 90 seconds has kind of taken over our institutions. And I don't think it, I, I don't think it was planned. I think it just happened. Um, so, how long have I got? A bit more than long. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> um, Helen's book is brilliant uh, and really useful. And so Sex Matters supporters have sponsored uh, we've nearly um, 1,200 copies now. So we have sent copies on behalf of our supporters to their MPs, their MSPs, their members of the Welsh Assembly and other people. So people have sent them to head teachers, they've sent them to their boss anonymously. They've sent them to, um, you know, CEOs of companies and celebrities and, and you know, so, somebody said, Philip Pullman lives in my village, could you send this to him? <laughs> um, 
and and I, you know, and I so I sat on the terrace in the House of Parliament with Joanna Cherry. I gave her her book, and a Tory MP who I now can't remember came up to me, and she was like, "It's really brilliant what you're doing." And then she was like, <laughs> that was like that. She was scared, but you know, they are talking about it and using it, and it's brilliant. Um, and I think the thing that it tells is this saga of how the words were lost and how the words were lost in this there's a kind of three-way thing between the doctors saying there's a very small minority of people with a very extraordinary need and condition and we can do this extraordinary thing for them because we're doctors and we like to play god and we can do this thing and then you have the lawmakers going well if you can do that then maybe you need some rights around that and then you have the judges looking at individual cases and they're looking at the person in front of them and thinking about the situation of that person and not necessarily thinking about what does it mean if I say that a man can be a woman in this situation? How does that break institutions? How does that break logic? And once you've broken it, everywhere else tries to fit in with that. So you've done something for this very small group of people and said, oh, it's not really going to matter. And then it breaks everything. Um, and it's interesting. So, so we, sex matters. We've got a page on the website of case law, and we're trying to collect all of the all of the case law and understand how this how this happened. Um, and when you look at the judgments about questions about sex and gender, you know, going back from 1970 to to now, there's a flip between judges living in the world of reality and trying to describe reality. You know, this is a person who um, has rights, who has needs, but who is male and wants to live as female. Or do the judges get into the fantasy with somebody and say, she, this is a woman. Um, and, you know, that has shifted from, um, you know, from when, when these cases first started. So the... Um, and you look back at the, so a case that was referenced in my judgment um, of uh, April Ashley, so the, um, what's it called, Corbett, Corbett, the, Corbett and Corbett. Uh, so April Ashley was a female impersonator, a young gay female impersonator who became one of the first um, transsexuals and married a, um, an aristocrat who then wanted out of the marriage and that was what the case was about and the judge in that case was a doctor and he said sex is genes genitals and gonads and normally in almost all cases those three are congruent congruent so he basically said sex is biological and in my judgment uh akak chowdhury the, the judge in my judgment said that still holds um and when you read that judgment, ju um, Justice Ormrod, he, he, says, he says, her outward appearance at first sight was convincingly feminine, but on closer and longer examination in the witness box, it was much less so. The voice, manner, gestures and attitudes became increasingly reminiscent of the accomplished female impersonator. <laughs> he was describing what he could see, and the judgment is not, he, you know, he's not taking the mickey or being unsympathetic, but he's describing reality. Whereas if you look at the much more recent judgments that involve this, judges are stepping into um, the fantasy. Um, and so around that time in 1995, when I was in the pub in Newcastle being told you can't say transvestite anymore, um, there was a case being brought to the U European Court of Human Rights which was um, uh, P versus Cornwall. So this was a, another late, this was a late transitioning man who lost his job working for Cornwall County Council and brought that case to tribunal like I did and said I shouldn't have lost my job. And he shouldn't have lost his job for being trans. I think, you know, I think most people would agree that, agree that. But because there was no... Um, rule that said he couldn't have, shouldn't have lost his job or he, he brought the case under sex discrimination he said the reason why he lost his job on saying that he was going to transition um, was sex discrimination and the government said no the government said because sex means sex but the European Court of Human Rights said 
that was sex discrimination. So letting someone go because they were trans was treating them um, unfavourably in comparison with a person of the sex which he or she was deemed to belong before undergoing gender reassignment. So they were, they were taking discrimination law and saying, in order to protect someone who is trans, we're going to say that they've changed sex, rather than saying we should protect people who are trans because they're trans, um, which is you know, the kind of reality land proposition. But instead, they started to step into the fantasy land proposition and say this person was discriminated because he was becoming a woman. But you know, he wasn't becoming a woman. He was, he was becoming a transsexual. Um, that was 1995 in the UK. The same judgment has just been made, the Bostock judgment in the US Supreme Court, very, very similar to that. Um, and I think, it was a wrong, I think it was a wrong turn because I think laws need to be based in reality. We need to say if someone is being treated badly because they're a transsexual, they need to be protected because they're a transsexual, not because we all have to believe that they've changed sex. Um, so, after, so after that one, um, they put gender assignment into the, into the Sex Discrimination Act and then into the Equality Act. Um, and straight away, after, after they put it into the Sex Discrimination Act, so this was to protect people from losing their job because they're trans. The next case, straight after that, was a case of um, a man called Croft who worked for the Royal Mail, and he wanted to transition, and he wanted to use the ladies' toilets in the Royal Mail. And um, the case is really interesting. So this happened in 1999, and it finished in 2003. It went up to the um, Court of Appeal. So, you know, not that long ago. And if you read the, um, the judgment, it was still in reality land. They were still saying, well, your female colleagues don't feel comfortable with you in the women's toilets, and their feelings matter. The union stood up for the female colleagues. The management stood up for the female colleagues. They said, you know, we will support you. We are sympathetic, but other people have rights too. This was in 2003. They were saying that. Um, and so, the, so the, the, and the judges kind of kicked it into the long grass a bit, going, well, the GRA is being worked out, so we don't have to, we don't have to worry about it. But even in 2003, they were saying... It is legitimate for female colleagues to say we, we need female-only changing rooms. And the, and the law hasn't changed since then. Um, and Croft said, and, and so the post office offered Croft the unisex, there was a unisex. They weren't forcing him to use the, the male toilets. And he said, well, that um, makes my acceptance difficult. <laughs> Like, well, your acceptance is people accepting you, not people being forced to accept you because your employer um, forces them under pain of them losing their job, which is, you know, obviously what's happening now. Um, and so then, obviously, we had the Gender Recognition Act, or then we had Goodwin, who went to the European Court of Human Rights and said the fact that he was another late, tra he was a late transitioning bus driver, um, and he said that if, when he took his... Um, birth certificate to go and get insurance, people would see that he was a man or she was a man, depending on what pronouns you want to use for clarity. Um, and so they said, the European Court of Human Rights said that um, impinged on Goodwin's human rights so much that they would have to change the whole system of recording sex on birth certificates. So to, to accommodate um, you know, this, this person's need, they changed, they changed everything. And the judges said, um, society may reasonably be, be expected to tolerate a certain inconvenience. They didn't, they, they said, well, it's not going to cause a big problem, it's just an inconvenience. Um, and that's what then ended up in the Gender Recognition Act and um, us losing all of our words or, you know, sort of losing more of our words. And the cases that are going through now are challenging the words mother and father. Um, and also we know, you know, all of the stuff that's going on with children being transitioned will, will feed into the same kind of dynamic where the courts say, well, if the NHS does it, then we must 
give a right for it. And, you know, we're looking at what's gone on with Gender GP and what's gone on with the Tavistock. You know, if the NHS does it, turns out to be not a very good... Um, not a very good guide to, to anything. So I think, you know, the fact that the, the same thing is happening, it's continuing to happen, we're kind of at the end of the story of heads, shoulders, knees and toes, and we, we've lost all our words, but we're paying a lot more attention. Um, and so I think the good news is when you get to the end of the song, you get all the words back. <laughs> And it's a relief. And we need them all back. We need man, woman, female, male, mother, father, he and she. We need, we need them all back. And then we can negotiate. Then we can say what I will do to make you feel more comfortable in a particular social system. But we need to have our words back. Um, and that's what Sex Matters is doing. And I think we need to play the playbook backwards. So we need to do what was done. We need to talk. We need to organise. We need to raise money. We need to act politically, pragmatically. We need to write guidance. We need to get into corporations and the public sector and talk to them. And we need to take legal cases. And we, you know, it's not going to be over by Christmas, but I think we are turning a corner. <laughs>